So it's kind of this labyrinth of waterways when you get out into those marshes. So it's this really, it's, it's hard to get out there. If you don't have a boat, there's really no way to do it. There aren't a whole lot of roads out there, um, but it's a, for the people, those that get a chance to get out there, it's an incredibly beautiful place. From the river to the valley to the sea All the places, all the people that you can meet Welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. I'm Dean Klinkenberg, and I've been exploring the deep history and rich culture of the people and places along America's greatest river, the Mississippi, since 2007. Join me as I go deep into the characters and places along the river and occasionally wander into other stories from the Midwest and other rivers. Read the episode show notes and get more information on the Mississippi at MississippiValleyTraveler.com. Let's get going. Welcome to Episode 5 of the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. In this episode, I talk with Boyce Upholt, a top-notch journalist and excellent writer who goes deep into the subjects he writes about and is meticulous about getting the story's details right. He recently wrote about a plan to reverse the tide of land loss in an area in the area where the Mississippi River meets the Gulf of Mexico, which is the topic we focus on in this episode. Louisiana has lost over 3,000 square miles of coastal lands in the last few decades. We talk about how that happened, what we've lost, a plan to restore some of that lost coastal land, and why the plan isn't being embraced by everyone in the area. At the end, we talk a little bit about ways we might start valuing the land that goes beyond just the dollars and cents it yields for some of us. I'd like to give a quick shout out to new Patreon supporter, Al Wilson. Thanks, Al. Now on to the interview. Boyce Upholt is a writer and nature critic based in New Orleans. His journalism has appeared in, among other publications, National Geographic, The Atlantic, Smithsonian, and Oxford American. His story, The New Republic, about how a troubling new farm chemical sparked conflicts in Arkansas and what that means for the future of agriculture, won a 2019 James Beard Award. He's currently working on a book about the Mississippi River for W.W. Norton. In a recent article, he took a deep dive into the ambitious and challenging plan to reverse the loss of coastal land around the Mississippi Delta. The article ran in Hakai Magazine, and I hope I'm saying that name right. Welcome to the podcast, boys. Thank you. It's great to be here. It is actually pronounced Hakai, which is I had been pronouncing it long wrong for a long time, and then I saw in in the tw- their Twitter feed that it was Hakai, and I've tried to remember that now. <laughs> Excellent. See, that's the problem when you see words, when you only see the words and you don't hear them, uh, you're never quite sure how to pronounce. Well, today, uh, you know, I really wanted to have a chance to chat with you a little bit about your article about coastal land loss. Uh, That was an excellent piece, a nice in-depth article, too. uh, uh, And I I, it also re-ran in Wired magazine. So there are a couple different places people can read it. I'll post a link to that in the show notes. Why don't we just start with a little bit of background? Uh, tell us uh, a little bit about what the problem is, what coastal land loss really is. How did we get here? Yeah, and it's actually uh, there is some contention even within that. Um, I mean, what what coastal land loss is is pretty straightforward. Um, we, right there, there's all this marshland down in Louisiana that was all made by the Mississippi River, and it's been disappearing um for for decades really although it was uh only i mean 50 60 years now we've we've kind of had that confirmed but it, it goes back even decades before that the rates have gone up and down um there's there's various causes right as the sea levels rise with climate change it's going to get even worse um there's issues about uh if you cut a canal through the marshes, that might bring salt water into ecosystems that can't really tolerate salt water. And so the plants die off. And then that means the soil is no longer held in place. Um, but the big thing and the reason why this is a story about the Mississippi River is um, what a lot of people blame is the construction of the levees along the Mississippi, which I'm sure your listeners have some experience with. Um, and, and in particular, the problem down here in Louisiana, where I live, is uh once you get kind of south of uh 
Gold River in uh, on the Louisiana Mississippi border. You are into what's called the Delta, and there the Mississippi used to have all these distributary distributaries where um, sort of essentially the river will start forking apart and following various paths to the sea. Um, and each of those paths would carry some water, would carry some mud that would replenish the marshes down here. Um, and throughout the 19th and 20th century, a lot of those distributaries were closed for reasons of flood control. Um, then the levees also keep water from flowing over the banks and, and depositing more mud. And so we have this situation now where the Mississippi and its mud just kind of goes straight down all the way through, um, never splits off. And and actually the current uh, sub-delta, the Plaquemines sub-delta, reaches almost nearly to the edge of the continental shelf. And so it's like once the mud is coming out of the mouth of the Mississippi now, it kind of just tumbles off into this deep abyss and and it's not able to, to collect it all. And so that is potentially a major cause. We can just talk more. I mean, there are some scientists that say that's not actually the big deal here, um, but that is the cause that uh, has gotten the most attention and that, that most scientists do put a lot of blame on. So part of that too, as I understand it, is... Uh... And I've seen kind of conflicting studies on this, but the the Mississippi, the lower Mississippi does not carry as much sediment as it used to because of the giant dams we right. built on the Missouri River. But it seems yep. like even in the you know, some of the studies seem to suggest that the pro the lower Mississippi probably still carries enough sediment that it could build land if it was allowed to. Did you come across those yeah. kinds of studies? What do you think of that? I did. Yeah. I, and I, this was a piece it, it wound up being very well read, which I was happy with. And I got lots of reader emails for this one. And one of the emails I got was someone was like, why didn't you talk about the dams? Um, and obviously like, if you look, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the, the amount of sediment load in the Missouri river is just fractions of what it was less than 10%, I think of its historical amount. So that's a huge difference. Um, I'm pretty confident that, I mean, like, in a crazy world where we could do anything, I, I'd be interested to see what happened if we pulled out all the dams in the Missouri. It would, um, it could do a lot of interesting things. Uh, but I think where we're at now, I feel pretty confident that there's still enough mud in that river to, to build land, in part because of the Chafalaya River. So that's the one I talked about these distributaries. The only distributary essentially that's not closed now is the Chafalaya River, which comes out at Old River, which I mentioned before is sort of the beginning, the northernmost point in the delta. Um, and actually, just Last week, I think that the Corps of Engineers released a study they've been working on for years. Nobody has known quite how much mud goes down the Atchafalaya. So like by law, roughly on average, 30% of the water goes down the Atchafalaya. But nobody was sure if it brought 30% of the mud or or what was going on there. And I think they've just now said the their best estimate is about 13% of the Mississippi River's mud is making it through this system of engineering into the Atchafalaya River. And yet at the mouth of the Atchafalaya, you're seeing land building there. So even it's like all this diminishment, even without the, the Missouri's heavy load that it used to have, and then even with just 13% coming down that river, that is still enough mud to to build land. So that really shows how muddy this river system is. And, and yeah, there are other places down w in the Delta where there have been sort of like small cuts because of oystermen have, have cut little canals and things like that. We've seen that there is enough mud in there to, to build land, at least in some occasions or some circumstances. Hmm. Yeah, great. Um, so the uh, the mouth of the Atchafalaya is it's not the only area, but it's the only significant area where there's new land being built by the river's mouth, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think some, some scientists would contest that. I mean, there's a new, there was a, a new cut uh, down in Plaquemines Parish. So in the last couple dozen miles of the Mississippi that that we're only starting to look at see now what it's doing but but there does appear to be some land building there um, but for a long time the Atchafalaya has been sort of the example held up of where there has been land building and the way that rivers can this river system in particular can still do so mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about what this land is like you mentioned marshy you know what, what, can you describe a little bit what this, what that meeting of the Gulf uh, and the Mississippi what that area is like yeah, absolutely. I would love to. I, and I've come to think of it, the Delta, as essentially consisting of, I break it into kind of two typologies here, right? So you've got what I 
talk about sometimes all, pretty often is like fingers. Um, so like the river itself, as it's coming down and building out its its path, it's dropping the various heaviest mud right along its banks. And then you so you get these like long natural levees. They're, they're very similar to levees, but they're laid down the, the river itself, two long strips of land right along where the river's flowing. Um, and that is New Orleans, where I'm sitting right now, is built on one of these natural levees. It's it's the highest ground in the delta and so the, that's the the basic the beginnings of the delta are these fingers different paths reaching out into the gulf of mexico um but that percentage wise is a pretty small amount of of land to, the, to whatever set you want to consider it land down here uh most of the sort of like ecosystem the landscape is not these ridges but between these ridges there's marsh sometimes swamps and places where there is, you know, the, the the level of land is a little bit lower than atop these river built ridges. Uh, it's mud that is sort of kind of flowing over those natural levees and, and getting laid down. In some places, the mud got stacked high enough by those processes to actually break above the, the level of the ocean. And a lot of other places it hasn't, but it was like nearly close enough that maybe certain species could come in and, and take root. And then those species would you know, live and die over generations and and they would sort of form new soils themselves. And so it's high, high organic soil contents. In some places, there's what what uh, is called flottant, um, which I believe is a French word from the sound of it, uh, which is there's sort of whole portions of marsh grass that are essentially floating on the water because they're just like growing out of compacted marsh from before that. So it's, you know, I've, I've spent my travels on the Mississippi River have mostly spanned St. Louis down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but I find like when you really get down into these marsh grasses, it's, it's one of my favorite portions of the river. It's, uh, I mean, it's not a, a super diverse ecosystem. It's, it's a lot of these marshes are just one species of marsh grass going for acres and acres, but it's just this like vibrant electric green. You get all these birds flying in and out of them and you get these winding bayous through the marsh grasses. Um, so it's kind of this labyrinth of waterways when you get out into those marshes. So it's, it's really, it's, it's hard to get out there. If you don't have a boat, there's really no way to do it. There aren't a whole lot of roads out there, um, but it's a, for the people, those that get a chance to get out there, it's an incredibly beautiful place. Yeah, it helps have a boat. I remember a few years back, uh, I was on a canoe trip with John Rusky and the Quapaw Canoe Company, and we took a little side trip where we got out of the canoe and walked around one of those grassy areas. And I had no idea what to expect. You know, I kind of thought this was kind of floating grass, and I'm, am I going to step through and end up, you know, knee deep or hip deep in water? But it was fairly firm to walk on in the right. area where we were. Right. So I, I know there are different kinds of marsh grasses. Uh, some of the areas we passed, I think, was Ruzo Cane. Um, but it's, it is like, it is kind of this mass of grass in a lot of places with that thick organic mud kind of, uh, cementing everything together. Right. Kind of like a, a prairie in a way, like in the, and it feels a little bit like a prairie landscape to me at times, but. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's another form of grassland, right? Prairies, right. it's different, different ecosystems, different species, very different soils. The soils down here are going to be much wetter and uh, saltier in the case of salt marsh, but it essentially is that there's are conditions that like the conditions of the prairie produce these yeah, grasslands. And, and to me, grasslands, part of the beauty in them is like photographs don't do it. You kind of have to be there because part of the beauty is the scale. We're just like, oh my gosh, I'm just for as far as I can see and in every direction. It's just this endless ocean of non-ocean and it's a weird way so. right plus i think it kind of creates a, a feeling of vulnerability you're kind of, you're out there completely exposed with nothing to hide behind and yep um, i think that's a feeling we should probably all have more often to remind ourselves Absolutely. of our vulnerable natures but um so then that's also an area then where there's a mix of salt water and fresh water it's kind of brackish i guess can you tell me a little bit about what lives in the waters around there what kind of wildlife would be living in that uh, in those marsh areas yeah um absolutely i mean so you're you're absolutely right that there's this mix of brackish fresh salt water and in particular i mean so the delta in some ways you can think about it it's almost triangular shape as the name implies and and the further north you are further away from the gulf of mexico you're going to have fresh water you'll have like freshwater cypress swamps the chafalaya basin is the largest freshwater swamp river swamp left in the United States, um, that's part of the Delta. Um, but then as you get closer and closer to the ocean itself, you're going to get more, the, the salt from the ocean is going to be more and more capable of kind of like 
filtering its way up into these bayous and these different labyrinthine waterways. And so there's this gradient as you go south or as you get closer to the ocean, it's going to get saltier and saltier. Um, and that has everything to do with what lives there is there are a lot of species that their life cycle requires them at certain stages to be in like low salt brackish water and at other stages to get down out into much saltier water. And so in particular, uh, blue crab and shrimp both need to cycle through that so, sort of whole flow. Um, and that has shaped the human history of the Delta hugely because those have been, become species that indigenous people would catch and eat. And then after settlers came in, um, the the industry of the, the first industry of the, the marsh, at least, was um, often catching shrimp and fish. And it's precarious today, but it still continues. So, mm -hmm. so um, how has the loss of those marshlands affected the, uh, the wildlife that lives in those areas? That's a good question. I mean, it's like hard. That was a something I was trying I've been, for a while. I've been trying to sort of pin down and it is it's not an easy question to answer, right? I mean, some species can pick up and move. And so like our, if you look at a certain 10 square acres of, of marshland that you, it's something that used to be marsh and is not marsh now, it's going to be very different, right? There maybe used to be shrimp in there. And if it's just open water, the shrimp aren't going to come in the same way. The big question to me is, are those shrimp gone or are they just somewhere else? I think what has been most compelling, and I don't have hard numbers on this, but there's some ornithologists that have been looking at bird migrations, right? And that's a very complicated process. There are right, these birds go so many different places. There are so many things that could threaten them. But over the decades, as we've seen the sharp decline in the marshes, um, we've also seen huge shifts in the number of birds that are coming up through the Mississippi flyway, right? Um, uh, they're, one of the comparisons I found powerful was someone looking at sort of Audubon. Back in Audubon's day, I think someone went out and could shoot, I think, hundreds of birds within an hour. Um, and now that that same bird, I think it was a plover, you'll be lucky if you see maybe a dozen plovers in a whole day of sitting out there and observing. And so it's, again, it's hard to say, is it the loss of, of the marshland that does that? But these species that are flying for hours and hours across, across the Gulf of Mexico, kind of finding the space that is full, filled with these foods like shrimp and crabs, that there is a little bit of stability for them to land in, that is a really vital habitat for migrating birds. So that is one of the places where it seems like the loss of these lands is going to have much wider ecosystem effects. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like maybe part of what people suspect is that the, the loss of that land might be contributing to a decline in the number of those birds, or do we just think those birds are migrating along different routes? Or Yeah, this is, that, that would be the other variable. I mean, I would... I think certainly some people would hypothesize the loss of, of this this marsh in particular is hurting birds. I mean, certainly the loss of wetlands broadly, right? This is uh, Louisiana is this weird place where it's it's so famous for wetland loss, and yet it has much more wetlands left than many other places. And so I think that's impacting birds broadly. But um, you know, the, the, the delta in Louisiana remains this huge expanse, a really important expanse of this kind of habitat that's disappearing everywhere and that's part, partly why people are so concerned it's like it just clearly birds that need this landscape are threatened because it's disappearing everywhere for various reasons and the fact that we're now losing louisiana as well is is a big problem mm -hmm. well so take us through what the plan is to try to reverse this uh, it's a yeah it's not a modest plan <laughs> not a modest plan no um I mean, the big, it, it's back in the 19, early 1970s, the first kind of report that made big waves in the scientific community kind of confirming that this was a problem. It, in that very first report, there was this idea of like, well, we know this delta was built by the Mississippi River. If we want delta to come back, like more delta to be built, maybe we have to let the Mississippi River do what it used to do. And so for... 50 years, there's been talk of like, how can we, right? We've built these levees, closing the river in, we closed off these distributors. What can it look like to, to kind of cut this back open and let the river flow back out into the Gulf of Mexico in more places? Um, and so the state of Louisiana, um, since the, after Katrina um, really damaged New Orleans, that this proposal started to, to kind of uh, be looked at more seriously and, and money started coming behind it the, in a sort of ironic twist to the um, BP oil spill brought more money to these sorts of projects. And so the 
CPRA, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Agency, I hope I have that right, I always get it mixed up, um, is the state agency that is in charge of sort of both protecting places like New Orleans from flooding, but restoring these disappearing ecosystems. And they've talked about making as many as 10 of what they call sediment diversions. So these kind of cuts through the levees that would be carefully engineered to carry water and mud back out into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the one that will be built, I mean, there are some very small ones that have been built already, but the, the largest that is, has been proposed will also be the first one that is likely to be built. And so that will be built in a, a parish in Louisiana called Plaquemines Parish. Um, it will carry water into what's called Barataria Bay, um, which is just east of the river in Plaquemines Parish. Sorry, no, just west of the river in Plaquemines Parish. Um, and so it will carry this huge volume of water and mud back into this bay where there has been a ton, a ton of land loss. Um, and it is an active project, right? The Army Corps of Engineers right now is sort of looking over the proposal. Um, they've already released an environmental impact study and it's sort of any day now should be, uh, I think it's this fall, they're going to be... Um, making a decision about yes or no, but but signs lean towards that they will approve this and then construction can begin sort of unleashing at the Mississippi River once more, at least in this one place in Plaquemines Parish. Well, now not everybody is an enthusiastic supporter of this uh, idea. Can, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the folks who are against it and what the reasons are that they don't like this idea? Yeah, it's been very controversial. Um, I will, let me say first, I mean, like there has been a huge amount of enthusiasm. A lot of scientists are very enthusiastic. A lot of um, people concerned about restoration of habitat have been very enthusiastic. On the flip side, people in Plaquemines Parish, the place where it is going to be built, have been very opposed to it. Um, that is driven, the, the biggest driver of that is the seafood industry, which is again, the, the big historical industry in the Delta. Um, what, what's happening is shrimpers, it's just a, a super tough industry in a lot of ways. It's changed over the past 50 years. Um, essentially the, the cost that a shrimper will get for shrimp has not gone up as fuel rises, the cost of fuel rises. So people are getting pinched more and more and more. Um, and so in some ways, land loss has been good in various ways. I, I don't think anyone would articulate, no, no shrimper would say like, oh, we're glad land loss has happened, but um, sort of the fracturing of the, the marsh means there's more edge and more edge can sometimes lead to more population of things like shrimps. Uh, and as the marsh is retreating inland, uh, shrimpers often don't have to go as far to get shrimp. And so the concern that a lot of shrimpers have is like, well, if you're going to put all this fresh water right back into this bay where we've been catching shrimp, uh, it's just going to push the shrimp even farther out. We're going to have to, you know, they're already kind of pushed the limit financially trying to get the shrimp now. Like we can't, they can't afford the gas to go even further out. And so they're kind of saying this will be the end of this multi-decades, deeply traditional industry in this place. Um, and so they're deeply opposed to it. Uh, on top of that, there's sort of a lot of other concerns that get layered on top. So um Dolphins will definitely be impacted in Barataria Bay. It looks like the, the modeling that, that has been shown is like they will almost certainly not be able to survive this fresh water. So some individual dolphins would likely be sort of like hit by so much fresh water that they could become sick or even be killed by it. Um, potentially, maybe some of these dolphins would just be able to kind of shift and move habitat. As I said, that's one of the open questions in these sorts of things. But um, there's enough concern about dolphins that that's that's raised another bit of controversy um and then beyond that because the delta itself is there's a lot of it's a just very multi-ethnic community you have uh black fishing communities you have cajun fishing communities you have a couple um indigenous communities that are still left and so that just complicates the entire project it, it a lot of the negative impacts of this project may come back to sort of these historically disadvantaged communities and that has brought a lot of attention to this as well mm-hmm well, plus it's also layered on the like the historic urban rural um, divide. Yes. Just, you know, let's say yep. trust breaches that going back to major floods. And the 1927 flood is the classic case. You mentioned that in the article where yep. they uh, they blew a hole in a levee uh, in Plaquemines Parish uh, to save New Orleans, essentially. And right. there's a lot of debate about whether or not they even really needed to do that at that time, whether it was necessary. And there were lots of right. promises made for a financial support to help the community recover that were never um, they never followed through on. They didn't respect those, their promises uh, that that's and even though this was 90 years ago. Uh, right. People have a, a long memory. Uh, people. Have, yeah. People like to. Yeah. Stories get passed down and, and traditions get passed down in the place. And yeah, that, that's a big piece of it. And I think that even people that aren't, you know, 
people who live in Plaquemines who aren't fishermen. Um, I think that sort of history drives it further. And then it, it's not just that history. If you drive down, so that that uh, in 1927, they actually blew the levee in St. Bernard Parish, just above Plaquemines Parish. After Katrina, when they built a flood wall um, to protect New Orleans, it wound up being built, I believe, right on the Plaquemines Parish, St. Bernard Parish line. And so there's literally this wall that you drive through as you drive south on the um, east bank of the river where you're like, okay, now I'm out of sort of out of the system of protection. So that if a hurricane comes in, if, if something bad happens, you feel like you're you're very much on the edge of the earth. And so people are very aware of this sense of like this landscape broadly, the marsh in particular is not always been valued by the US government, by settler people. Um, and then Plaquemines Parish in particular has been mistreated in multiple ways is, is the way it's often seen. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the um, uh, part of the concern is maybe this the disproportionate impacts on indigenous communities or African Americans in the area. Are, can you can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like, uh, what are the ways that uh, is it because they're shrimpers and they might lose access to shrimping, or are there other a uh, angles to this or aspects to this? Uh, I mean, it's it's largely that. Particularly, um, I'm trying to googling this now. I believe it's the name of the town is Phoenix. Um, so there's one, uh, at least one. I think multiple. Um, just towns in Plaquemines Parish that are largely African American and that have a long tradition of fishing. So um, part of it is so the, the history of the marshland. As I said, settlers came in, wanted to build farms, cities like New Orleans. Those went on these higher ridges, these fingers reaching through that kind of left the marshes not empty, but more, right? Like it became a space that was because the wealthiest people were less interested in it, uh, became a space where people that otherwise didn't have opportunities could sort of find ways to make a living. Um, and so that turned the Delta into this very ethnic place. You've got Filipino fishermen, you've got Vietnamese fishermen, you've got black fishermen, you've got Cajun French fishermen. Um, and so some of that is, yeah, just this history of how this place came to be and, and those people staying rooted in these communities that mean a lot to them now. Um, in terms of indigenous populations in particular, I don't necessarily get the sense uh, that the indigenous people I've spoken to are opposed to the diversion per se, um, but more that they feel kind of left out of the conversation. So in particular in Plaquemines Parish, there's a Grand Bayou Village, which let me make sure I'm getting um, the tribe name correct. They are... Atacapa Ishak Chawasha. Um, and so there's, it's this community in Plaquemines Parish that uh, it's just a, basically a row of houses on a bayou, but it's completely just disconnected from the mainland now, kind of surrounded by the marsh um, that has sort of sustained ties to this place for hundreds, potentially thousands of years. Um, and this is a group of people that is not seeking federal recognition from the government, which has been really hard to come by in Louisiana because of the particular history here. Um, so it's, it's just this place that for many years was kind of like forget forgotten and overlooked by the authorities. Um, and these are people that had developed deep kinships with this ecosystem and this landscape. Um, and they just, nobody really bothered to ask them as these plans started rolling out of like, what would you like to see done? And so it's not always opposition to the diversions, um, but it's also just like, there are a lot of other things that we can and should be doing here. Um, there's a lot of talk about one of the, one of the controversial things is the oil and gas pipelines that have been kind of like stitched throughout these marshes at, for companies to come in and extract oil. Um, the way those have contributed quite a bit to land loss, according to some scientists, may be the primary cause of land loss. Um, but there hasn't been much. So one, one action you can take is fill those canals back in. It might not kind of restore land, but it certainly will help land from continuing to disappear. And that's an action that the state has mostly avoided doing. And some of the indigenous people I've spoken to have said, like, let's do that. And in the absence of government action, have been seeking other avenues to make sure that that can happen, uh, that sacred sites that mean a lot to people um, that have meant deeply important things to people for thousands of years, that those places can be protected by filling back in the, these canals that threaten them. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I've certainly seen probably a lot of the same studies you have that suggest those canal uh, for oil and gas exploration that were cut through the marshland may be the single greatest contributor to the loss of, of marshland. Um, so 
what do you what's the uh, budget for this project how much money are we are spending or is going to get spent on this uh, diversion plan who's paying for it uh, and well let's do that first overall like what do you, what are the cost estimates for this and where's that money coming from so the price I mentioned in the piece is $2 billion. And that made, I don't remember quite where, where I saw that, but that made it by the fact checkers. So I can feel confident that that is uh, pretty <laughs> close to accurate. Um, so yeah, $2 billion is, is I mean, depends on how you figure it from, from certain points of view. It's like this small drop in the federal budget. Um, from another point of view, it's a lot of things you could do with, with $2 billion. Um, but it, yeah, so it's a big, big pricey thing. And it's been described as the largest eco, you, you, that it's been described as the largest ecosystem restoration project in the US. Um, I don't know if that's by budget or just by scale of acreage looking to be restored. And that 2 billion, is that just for that one diversion uh, into the Barataria that Bay? Is, that is just for that one diversion, yes. So the whole uh, the CPRA's coastal master plan, um, again, I, I don't have the most up-to-date numbers. I believe it's $50 billion just uh, for sort of the stuff they've laid out so far, which is, uh, the first of kind of multiple desired iterations. So the overall effort to save the coast, which is, there's a lot of other projects that we're not talking about here. There's sort of uh, mud is being shipped out or piped out to, to be restored places. There are coastal islands that are being restored. There's a lot of different things that are part of that project, but the full project is $50 billion or more. Uh, and is that all expected to be federal dollars then or... I don't suppose the oil and gas companies are contributing any money to this pool. They are actually um, not necessarily willingly, but um, they there's sort of been laws set up that, and they make a lot of sense. There's there's a certain justice to that. If oil and gas have, has contributed to this problem, some of the revenues um, from oil and gas, I think from federal oil and gas income, I'm not. Uh, should fact check that, but I believe that it's federal revenues then get re-diverted toward these these projects. I mean, most of the money so far, that $2 billion for this diversion, the mid Barataria sediment diversion, I believe is coming from um, the BP oil payout. There was just a study this past week, though, that was kind of looking at BP money has been the primary driver of uh, coastal restoration for a decade and a half, or I guess a decade since that oil spill. Uh, that money... Is going to run out before too long, I think, within the next 10 to 12 years. And it is not clear yet kind of how we will go about paying for uh, the scale of the projects we'll need to save this coastline. You sort of hinted at this before, but I just want to make sure I'm, I'm getting this right, too. Uh, uh, you know, I think in, in 1990, Congress passed a, passed a, a plan for some coastal restoration efforts, right? Uh, um, I just don't the have the name of it right in front. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what the reason we're doing, we're going much bigger now is essentially because of Katrina and because suddenly some folks think there is value for that extra marshland and protecting New Orleans in particular from big storms. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think that the, the Bro Act was a big win at the time, right? So I, I, again, I don't have precise figures, but it was really the first time that the federal government took seriously this problem and started funding some of these projects. Um, but it, there was just never, I think it was in the, maybe the, the tens of millions of dollars a year that when you're talking about a project that's $2 billion, tens of millions of dollars isn't going to get you there. Right. Um, and so I do like in this piece in particular, but the way I've come to think about the diversions is Katrina was this major impetus that built urgency around these projects. Um, and to me, that's, I mean, neither good nor bad, like good in many ways. I think these projects are urgent, but to me, one of the interesting facts about it is the reason why I see that as building urgency is, is that it was a rare moment when what an ecosystem needed was the same thing that some fairly wealthy landowning people needed in that they saw, oh crap, <laughs> these marshes have been disappearing. And part of the science here is the marshes, you know, we've got storm surge, we've got hurricanes, the marshes can absorb both of those things. It can kind of like stop a storm surge that's driven by a hurricane from rolling inland. It can also kind of just like suck up some of the kinetic energy of the storm as the storm is passing over the marshes. It's just getting dry, like slowed down and slowed down so that once the storm gets to a place like New Orleans, the presence of the marshes can help really weaken that. And so the devastation that happened after Katrina 
there's a lot of things that caused it, right? It's a failure of the the hurricane protection system in the city as well. But but as people were like, well, we don't want to see this happen again. Um, we have a lot of money invested in this town. All of a sudden, the marshlands that for so long had been seen as at best sort of a place where we should just dredge some canals and drive some pump jacks so we can get oil out of it. All of a sudden, it became something that um, had value to people. Um, and so, yeah, that that's... That was a big impetus that that's where the CPRA emerged as the state said, we need to do something about this. And then ironically, again, it was the the BP oil spill that um, actually put this injection of money into things, which is not something I raised in the piece, but that has its own irony of without that industry, it's not clear where the money comes from. Right. So we, we've lost, uh, I forget the number off the top of my head, but you know, but two or 3000 square miles uh, of, Coastal marshes, essentially, something in that range. I believe that's right. Yeah, in the this is a Hack Eye is a Canadian magazine, so I had to put everything in, in metric. But it's five thousand square kilometers is the the number I have in here. Right. So, so that's about yeah. roughly three thousand thirty two hundred something. Like yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and I forgot where I was going with that question. Hmm. Oh, I know what it was. So this particular project um, is really one uh, one way of trying to reverse the loss of coastal land but there are all there it's a much bigger problem beyond this one spot in the delta right um can you uh, i don't know how much you got into this but can can you talk a little bit about what some of the alternative ideas are that are out there for trying to deal with the loss of coastal lands yeah um i i was i didn't go into any of them as depth uh, in in the same depth so I will not be able to speak about them in the same depth now. But um, I mean, I know the, the thing that a lot of people in Plaquemines Parish talk a lot about is this sort of shipping of mud out. If like, let's essentially mechanically recreate marsh um, by we, we're always dredging the Mississippi River, right? To, so that this, the tow boats can go through. And the concept there is like, well, rather than just kind of like dropping that in the channel and having it be carried out down into this abyss off the continental shelf, let's take that mud that we've dredged and carry it out so that we can like put it back into the marshes. Um, what a lot of people will say is like, that's just an incredibly expensive process. And it's not a process that uh, the beauty of the diversion is that you sort of don't need fuel or anything. It's like letting the river do all of that work itself. That really, to me, is the the biggest proposal I've seen. I mean, I know you and I have talked about um, some other studies of like, do people should people be down here? Um, the the reality is there's there's a lot of retreat underway because of climate change. Um, it's not it's it's at this point it's not a thing that any politician would ever openly propose of like oh we just think people should leave Blackman's Parish because that would bring a lot of fire and fury. But um, there are places a place in the marsh. Ile de Jean Charles is another indigenous community that is on the other side of Barataria Bay. Um, and it, it basically there was an effort there to that this community decided they did want to retreat and move somewhere else um, and just become a very messy process. It's something else I've written about um, the process of, of sort of like a an unrecognized indigenous community that, that doesn't have official federal status trying to work with the state. Um, became mired in a lot of complexities of, of who should get to decide what um, and a lot of people came away from that being very unhappy. So uh yeah there's not i don't know there's not a whole lot of other things that i see um i mean the status quo right now is we're going to keep losing land we're going to keep making whatever projects we can communities after they get blasted by hurricanes some people will come back and some people won't and we're just going to kind of slowly see uh, a trickle of population out of this place is is the unfortunate reality if, if we don't find something that works right basically sort of like a slow attrition um right um, yeah I don't know if this came up at all in any of the with any of the people you talked about. I've always been curious whether this particular proposal ever was discussed uh, down in the in New Orleans area or along the coast. There, I think it was six years ago now. I'll send you the link later if you haven't seen this study before. But a group of researchers from Washington University here in St. Louis essentially proposed giving up on half of the um, the the delta below around like point all a hash uh, just kind mm. of giving up on trying to build anything below that point and letting that land disappear not putting any effort into continuing to rebuild there and using that new area around that spot 
to build a new bird's foot delta and to put efforts into diversions around there. Um, anybody you talk to familiar with that idea? Uh, discuss it I at Googled, all? I Googled it as you're talking and this, it confirmed my suspicion as is about six years ago, there was sort of a competition that was held. And I don't remember exactly who hosted that competition, but there was sort of this, a number of teams were invited to kind of build proposals of like, what could it look like to have a future for the Delta that allows us to keep a navigation system here um, and reckons with this, these changes. And so um, I became a little bit more familiar with a, a rival proposal that would be in part because it was proposed by scientists down here that I know a little bit better. Um, my, it's not, this isn't, it's not something I got as deeply into in this piece in part because it, um, it feels a little academic to me, which I, it, I guess I'm, I don't mean it to be dismissive, but I, I find a lot of legislative and academic proposals that are out in the world as a journalist, I try and stay aware of them, but, but so often they're so far from coming to reality. Um, and so like it, 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 this felt like an important intellectual exercise, um, but but the things that came out of this competition, none of them felt particularly close to uh, implementation. Um, yeah. But that said, I mean, some of the things that that I have seen proposed in that competition may, for other reasons, come to pass. That this I, I mentioned before, a second place where land is being built um, that is in Plaquemines Parish. A number of people now, within the past year, are kind of saying like, there's an avulsion happening, right? So. Uh, your listeners may be familiar with the the worries that that the Mississippi could head down the Atchafalaya. That would be what's called the vulgian of this shifting of of, of the river's path. Uh, right now, some people are saying actually a vulgian is happening right now as we speak. Not as you know, three hundred miles upstream in, in the Atchafalaya, but just like a couple dozen miles up from the current mouth, there is this new opening that is that is getting bigger and bigger and building more and more land. And that kind of matches some of the proposals that were in this competition. So um, it may come about less because the academics were like, let's think about this and more just because nature does it that way. So is that new avulsion? Is that at Mardi Gras Pass or is that a different area? It's, it's near there. I like, I, I, I haven't, Doug is deeply into it. It's called Neptune Pass is, is one way that it, I think the core has been referencing that there's a guide down here named Richie Blink, um, who, who I've been out with, who wants to call it Avulsion Pass because it's an avulsion. Um, it is in that same strip. I mean, Mardi Gras Pass is in, for your listeners that don't know about it, it's called Mardi Gras Pass because back in, I think it's 2013, over Mardi Gras weekend, uh, sort of a flood tore a hole through the banks. There's a strip in the river, uh, in Plaquemines Parish where even before the 1927 flood, they had decided to take down the levees to see if that would kind of relieve flood pressures on New Orleans. And so that means in this place, there's a more natural riverbank. It's overtopped frequently whenever the floods come through. And that's where Mardi Gras Pass happened. It's in that same stretch downstream of there where this new avulsion seems to be, uh, seems to where the river's shifting more and more of its path. And I believe now it's sort of like 30% of the water in that stretch is now heading out this alternate route. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, it, we're kind interestingly, of nearing... it's, it's, go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say one of the interesting things about it is it's already becoming a question of what to do with that. So the army Corps is worried that all of that water going that way will cause shoaling. That will be a problem for some of the, the big freighters that are coming through. And so they want to build sort of underwater rock dike to keep it from growing any bigger. And then a lot of these scientists that are looking for ways to build land are saying like, well, we don't want to stop, right? Like this is a place that it is building land. And so it, how can we, what can we do in this new path so that it doesn't mess up our current navigation regime, but allows us to to allow the river to build the land as we've been wanting to do. So it's, it's another one of these sort of trade-off scenarios. Right. And isn't it one of the sort of unfortunate realities with this that if there's a conflict between maintaining the navigation channel and building land, isn't the navigation channel going to get higher priority? Yeah, I think most like like that that is a federal priority. Um, there are a lot of there's just a very robust set of legal protections in place for that. I think the hope here is that um, they can build sort of this underwater dike, and the, the, they don't need to seal this pass necessarily, but maybe with some like very refined engineering, they can control the flow a little bit so that it won't 
cause shoals elsewhere, but mud can continue to exit down that pass. But um, we'll see if that kind of complex level of engineering works out. Right. There's so many things to balance with all this uh, and uh, there, there are, are different people yeah. pushing different agendas and uh, it's a complicated mess, it seems. So it is. Uh, yeah. That, well, that's, I, that's what the Mississippi river is, right? A complicated mess. We've done a lot to it. It's a beautiful thing, but it's, a lot of hard decisions we face now. So right, that could have been, you know, a book title also, a complicated could, mess. So yes, it could have. So we're kind of winding down on time here, but I, I want to uh, ask one last question. Uh, it's you know, a lot of the. It seems like a lot of the drive for this particular effort now and scaling up the coastal restoration efforts came down to concerns about the economic impacts of the loss of those coastal lands. But those areas mean more than just, you know, things that we can measure in terms of, you know, dollars and cents. So do you have a few thoughts on other ways that we might think about valuing that land beyond just what they provide in terms of direct economic benefits? Yeah, I mean, the thing, right, so I've been researching this this book about sort of what the engineering up and down the Mississippi River for a few years now. And um, the thing that I did not expect when I launched that process was that I would get kind of so obsessed with indigenous history and prehistory and particularly indigenous earthworks which are uh places like cahokia but but there are a number of mounds like that down here in in louisiana and that sounds like maybe sounds like a strange answer to the question you asked but um to me there is this spiritual tradition that has existed along the mississippi river for thousands and thousands of years which i've come to see as something that has developed in reaction to understanding a river that is a complicated mess of people that that have lived here and decided they wanted to stay here, but to stay here, you had to find a way to reckon with these issues of floods and landscapes changing and things like that, that, uh, you know, the way we Americans have chosen doesn't seem to be working. And, and it, the fact that people survived here for thousands of years to me shows that they, they found a different way of engaging with the river. And in particular, there's sort of this, this kinship relationship with, with non-human beings of, um, so I quote, an indigenous woman in the piece, a leader of this uh, Grand Bayou village who talks about kind of everything being connected and, and you can't isolate any one thing and, and measure its value alone because just to do so, you just can't take things out of this circle of life in that way. Um, and yeah, I was just crit criticizing people for doing academic studies into sort of how might we change the Delta. And, and I think it, I could also be criticized. Like it will take quite a bit for, some of these values to to be spread widely enough for those to be embedded in our the way we approach river engineering. But um, I don't know. As someone, I, I think of myself as as a settler. I'm descended from people who arrived from elsewhere and and kind of came into this land. And um, I have lately made it a project a little bit of trying to learn the the wisdom of people that have been here much longer. And so to me, I'm, I'm very interested in and in sort of. Yeah, how we thread together the world that we built with uh, this indigenous world that has been here so much longer and persists and that we still need to learn from. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think uh, we were on the same page with a lot of that. So yeah, um, thanks for articulating so that for me. Uh, yeah. So where can people reach you or keep up with your work? What are the best places to follow you? That is a good question. I mean, my website is my name, Boyce Uppolt, B O Y C E U P H O L T dot com. That will at least be a good hub for people. I mean, like I'm, I'm fairly active on Twitter um, and have a number of other projects that are a little bit less Mississippi related, but recently started my own podcast that is kind of conversations about kind of what I was just saying about rethinking our relationship with nature um, implicitly, if not always explicitly, it's bringing in some of these indigenous ideas. So that's called the Rewild podcast. Um, you can find that on my website. And then I've just launched a newsletter called Southlands, which is kind of a guide to nature down here in the South where I live, which I think a lot of people, people think of the West as being the place where America is wild, um, but uh, there's a lot to discover down here. And so I'm trying to to highlight some of those places. So uh, if you head to my website though, you'll, you'll be able to, to get to any of those other things. Well, thank you so much for the conversation today. This was fantastic. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thanks so much, Dean. It's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure. If you're enjoying the show, share that love with other people. Leave a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. Each review makes a difference and helps other fans of the Mississippi River and the Midwest find this show. Uh, 
And now it's time for the Mississippi Minute. Today we're going to go in a slightly different direction. I have an announcement to make. I'm very excited to let you know that I have a new book coming out. The uh, official release date is September 1, uh, but it is currently available for pre-order through all the usual outlets. The book is called Mississippi River Mayhem, Disasters, Tragedy, and Murder on Old Man River. Uh, and it is published by Globe Pequot Press. It's a little bit of a different kind of book for me. Uh, it certainly has a heavy dose of history since uh, it focuses on historical events. But uh, for this book, I also really made an effort to try to tell the stories of these events, these tragedies, through the words of people who experience them as much as possible. So in this book, you're going to find chapters on uh, uh, disasters and tragedies like the New Madrid earthquakes back in 1811 and 1812, tornadoes that devastated river towns, floods beginning with the flood of 1844, which we don't really hear very much about, steamboat wrecks, and I divided these into three broad categories, so you'll be uh, separate chapters on snags, fires, and boiler explosions, and then there's going to be some... Uh, uh, chapters on specific steamboat disasters like the wreck of the Sultana, the Monmouth, and the Sea Wing. Uh, and if that's not enough for you, there'll be there's a chapter on brothels and prostitution in river towns, on prohibition and bootlegging, disease outbreaks like cholera and malaria, uh, the Milford Mine disaster in northern Minnesota, uh, the I-35 bridge collapse up in uh, Minneapolis and the drownings of college students, of college-age men in La Crosse, Wisconsin. As I said, these books are currently available for pre-order, so uh, you can go and check it out now. Uh, and I'm going to cover some of these uh, tragedies in more detail down the road in future podcast episodes. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to the series on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. I offer the podcast for free, but when you support the show with a few bucks through Patreon, you help keep the program going. Just go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg. If you want to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the Mississippi better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series that's set in places along the river. Find them wherever books are sold. The Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast is written and produced by me, Dean Klinkenberg. Original music by No Offense. See you next time.